Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's Watershed Breakfast Lecture Series. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning. If you'd like to go ahead and put your name and where you're zooming in from today into the chat so we can get a sense of who's here in the room with us, uh, make sure that the chat box is set to go to everyone so uh, we, can all, we can all see who's joining us this morning. Exciting to see so many of you joining from across the Hudson River watershed, across New York State. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Great. So uh, welcome, everyone. If you're just joining us, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Make sure it's clicked to go to everyone. And if you want to share your name, affiliation, where you're Zooming in from today, it's, it's great to see who all is joining us here. Great. So uh, thanks again for being here. My name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Just uh, one quick announcement from me is that we're really excited to be hosting our Wavemaker Awards benefit on Wednesday, May 17th at the Falcon. This is our annual celebration of our Watershed Wavemaker awardees and really all of the work that volunteers and, and everyone has been doing to support the Hudson River watershed. So we'll be excited to, to get together with live music and appetizers and celebrate this year's group of Watershed Wavemaker awardees. We're recognizing Russell, Russell Urban Mead, who founded the Breakfast Lecture Series and coordinated it as a volunteer for 15 years, along with the Village of Piermont Waterfront Re Resilience Commission, Hudsonia, and the Sanctuary, Sanctuary for Independent Media. So uh, if you are interested in joining us, tickets are on sale. We've got a couple different levels of ticket prices, trying to make this as inclusive as possible so we can all celebrate together. So we hope to see you at the Falcon on May 17th. So I am going to hand it over to our presenters. And so first up is Ben Gannon, Senior Environmental Resource Technician from the Ulster County Department of the Environment. While Ben is getting set up with his screen sharing, I'll just mention, um, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat. If you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A box. We'll take questions at the end of both presentations. So. Um, Put those in there and, and we'll get the, to them at the end of the program. And also wanted to thank NUIPIC and the Hudson River Estuary Program for supporting this webinar series. All right, cool. Emily, how's that look? Um, all right, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been going to the breakfast uh, webinar series for years, uh, even, even when it was back. Uh, in the diner in New Paltz. So um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So um, my name is Ben Gannon. I work for the county's Department of the Environment. Uh, we're a small staff coordinating environmental policy and resource planning within the Ulster County government. Uh, today, we are going to talk about road stream crossings. Um, so road stream crossings are critical components of our transportation and ecological networks. They connect both our human and ecological communities by allowing two long linear networks to intertwine and function until they don't function. Flooding, closed roads, degraded streams, and habitat uh, disconnection all result as consequences from poorly designed or poorly functioning crossings. So what is a road stream crossing? Let's see, a road stream crossing is really any structure that carries a road over a body of water. We look at culverts and bridges and all other types of crossings, but here at the Department of the Environment, we really tend to focus on culverts because bridges usually have less issues when it comes to stream connection, and uh, they're really uh, more, much more expensive than culverts. So what are we up to? 
Currently, um, our project is funded by the DEC's estuary program and Nui Pick. Um, and we are finishing road stream crossing assessments for all of the lower Asopus towns, which is a watershed here in Oster County. Um, we're working with those towns to prioritize eight crossings to go for conceptual designs. And we are sharing all of our project results with easy to use tools on an interactive website. So that was just a brief overview of what road stream crossings are. It's great when they work, but when they don't, we begin to see why they are essential. Problematic crossings have significant effects on our communities, both ecological and societal. These problems can pose safety risks and can be costly to fix. So we'll just walk through some problems just as a, a primer. Um, first, streams are long linear features and road stream crossings can easily cut off a stream, fragmenting this important habitat and causing declines in biodiversity. Flooding and sediment mobilization also can lead to large expenses when streams are confined um, by roads along their banks and in their floodplains. <clears throat> streams naturally want to move. It's how they function as a landscape feature. So I put in this quote by a famous fluvial geomorphologist called, uh, named Luna Leopold. The river is the carpenter of its own edifice. And we can see that here as the stream has worked its way under this house. This is in the upper Esopus watershed in the Catskills. And obviously all of these problems are exacerbated by climate change. And we're seeing the impacts already from more intense rain events. The failure of road stream crossings cause critical disruptions in our transportation network at the moments when we need them the most in cases of emergency. And it's also quite challenging to design for future conditions in the face of climate change. So what we're really doing is installing static infrastructure in a very dynamic environment. Watersheds are very complex systems, but yet their characteristics play an essential role in designing successful crossings. So now we have a good understanding of some of the problems that we face. Obviously, there are way more. Um, and with knowledge of the processes at work in the landscape, we can begin to implement resilient solutions. I just want to touch on this, this example here. Um, this is up in the watershed, in the Ashokan watershed um, on County Route 47. This is Cascade Brook that during Hurricane Irene washed out County Route 47. Uh, you could see the hole, it's about 24 feet deep and 50 feet wide, completely closing the road. So Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District, Ulster County DPW staff, and numerous other regional partners um, assessed the damage. And uh, here you can see the old structure was actually swept downstream in the high flow. Given that County Route 47 is an important transportation corridor, Ulster County installed a temporary bridge in less than 48 hours after the storm and eventually replaced it with a, a larger bridge allowing for high capacity flows. And you can see that it has a natural stream bottom and banks allowing uh, and accommodating for changes in water flow. Obviously that was an emergency situation. So here are some of these solutions we're implementing now. We start with field assessments. We have thousands of crossings in Ulster County. We're assessing these crossings in order to have good data to base decisions on. We're prioritizing projects based on that good essential data and making sure that efforts are focused on replacing crossings that can maximize benefits. I'll go over these first two a little more um, in, a, in a minute. Thirdly, we're using best management practices in design, replacing, and maintaining crossings. And this helps the structures function as they should. Lastly, these are expensive projects, so working to get projects funded through the numerous programs that exist is a large part of the solution toolkit. Um, I saw that there are a few attendees representing climate smart communities and task forces, so I did want to mention that road stream crossing inventories and management plans are listed actions in the climate smart program. So let's talk field assessment. Here in Ulster County, uh, we use a protocol called MOSCAP. MOSCAP is a multi-objective field assessment. Uh, and scoring framework that is used to prioritize road stream crossings for replacement and enhancement. Um, and it's made up of four different protocols. The first, it's really built on good modeling. Here in Ulster County, we have high resolution elevation data 
where we can do some terrain analysis to begin to predict where the road stream crossings are. So I wanted to come back to one of the first images here. Um, and our, our process is deriving streamlines from the elevation data, but then uh, setting a minimum threshold drainage area of a tenth of a square mile so that we're really looking at streams and, and not other drainage. And then we get to the field work. The first thing, or the first protocol that we're looking at as part of the MOSC app is aquatic organism passage. Uh, we use a protocol called NAC, and I won't get into this too much because I know Corbin is going to go over this. Um, but basically, we're examining how easy it is for aquatic critters to pass through the structure. The second piece of MOSC app is examining geomorphic compatibility using a protocol developed by the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. In this, we examine the stream and examine stream features uh, to get a sense of how well the stream and the structure are playing together. The third piece of the protocol is structural condition. Here we use a subset of the New York State Department of Transportation large culvert inspection protocol. Um, this really tells us how the structure is faring over its lifespan and if there are any issues that need attention. The fourth piece is a flood flow model developed by the Cornell Water Resources Institute. So really this whole process starts with GIS modeling and ends with GIS modeling. This model is a good predictor for how much flow a culvert can pass in any given storm. And it will tell us good information on when the road is expected to overtop and have road closure issue, issues. All right, so once we complete field assessments, we have a really solid data set to examine. We can see which crossings are the worst based on the different factors we studied in the field. We can also look more comprehensively at the crossings over large areas to see which of them are situated on essential road segments or which of them are located within disadvantaged communities. This prioritization lets us know which projects we should begin lining up for funding. And as I mentioned, here we're really focused on these six things. Four of them, or three of them we examine in the field. Um, the two that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, transportation criticality. Um, we're really looking at how essential is the road segment to societal function, especially in cases of emergency. And so the crossings that are located on critical transportation segments are a higher priority for us to ensure that they are resilient structures. And the last one is, is looking at where the structures are related in, dis, in um, terms of disadvantaged communities to begin to mitigate uh, current and historical impacts to those communities, which just happen to um, face more environmental issues than elsewhere. And so with all of the, the data that we collect in the field, it can be difficult to know where to begin. And so a, a big part of our current project is really trying to get to the bottom of the prioritization piece. And so if we have all of these factors that we're looking at, how do we use them in smart ways to, to kind of pick projects that come to the top? So I, I did wanna run through this quick example. This is a tool that will be available on our upcoming website for anyone to use. And by filtering and selecting for certain criteria, municipalities and their partners will be able to quickly prioritize projects. I do want to note that currently this is only built on the NAC data. And so eventually we will have all of the other factors that we look at incorporated into dashboard, dashboards such as this one. The exercise that I want to run through is um, imagining that I work for the town of Olive. So um, I'll select Olive in our municipality list. We'll zoom in. We will just see the features selected in Olive. The orange dots represent NAC crossings in the county of Ulster and here in the town of Olive. Then I'll select the NAC evaluation of severe barrier. You'll see some of the dots begin to disappear. So now on the map, only shown are, are crossings that have been evaluated to be a severe barrier to wildlife are shown. These crossings have a better chance of being funded and greater impact on restoring habitat connectivity. But you can see there's still a bunch of dots on the map. So I want to prioritize based on condition. I can select the condition of assessed culverts that are over five feet, really looking at our large culverts, and select poor condition 
as per the NAC protocol. You can see we zoomed in on this crossing on Brown Road in the town of Olive. So if I were the town of Olive, this could jump to the top of my priority list in lining up next year's budget. It just so happens I met with the town of Olive's highway superintendent, Brian Burns, just the other week. And this crossing is on his priority list, making it a great candidate for our current project in forwarding the site to conceptual design as part of, as, um, as part of our current project. And lastly, I wanna wrap up with another example. Speaking of prioritization, this is a crossing in Woodstock, New York on Wittenberg Road that after field assessment that we identified as a priority project as part of our last assessment project that was also funded by the SGR program in New Epic in 2020. You can see from this 3D image that it's in a low lying area. The road floods frequently. We talked with numerous landowners in the area and they can all vouch for how often the road floods. This is a photo of the inlet. You can see that there's sediment buildup, which is a, a big indication that the structure is improper for the road and the stream. Um, and this definitely contributes to flooding. The photo of the outlet, you can see that there is an outlet drop causing a barrier to aquatic life. This crossing is, is just upstream from the Sawkill Creek, a really important tributary to the lower Sophus. You can also see the condition of the, the concrete of the crossing which is uh, drastically degraded over time. So as part of our last project, the, we selected this site to go for final design. Uh, we received shovel ready designs from Ty and Bond, an engineering firm. Um, and thanks to Ty and Bond and our previous funders, um, we are actually replacing this project this year. I think the resolution just passed in the legislature this week. Um, and we're replacing the structure with assistance from the state WCRIP program, which Corbin will go over. We just received um, the award notification that we got $250,000 from the Water Quality Improvement Program. Um, so we're really excited to get started on this project this year. Um, and with that, um, I just wanna thank our funders, Nui Pick and the SRA program. Uh, with support from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund um, and thank Corbin and the WCRIP program for selecting our, our project to move forward. And maybe some, top, some point in the future, uh, we can give an update on how the project went. And that's, that's it for me. So thanks everybody. I'll turn it back over to Emily. Great, thank you so much, Ben. It's really exciting to see all of the groundwork laid with the assessments and having those tools so that the implementation projects can be prioritized and then funded. It's, it's, it's great to see the work that you all are doing in Ulster County. So next up is Corbin Gozier. Corbin is the Aquatic Habitat Program Manager at the Division of Fish and Wildlife for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So take it away, Corbin. Um. Hey, Emily, can you hear me okay? And, and am I showing the correct screen? Yep, looks great. Okay. Adjustment here on my screen. All right, hey everybody, thanks for having me. Um, ben, that was excellent. That was a, a good, um, good pres presentation to lead in what I wanna talk about today, which is aquatic connectivity at road stream crossings in New York. As, um, I uh, work out of our Albany central office, so my program is statewide. Um, and, and one of the things I do is support uh, aquatic connectivity across the state. Take a minute to explain how, how we do that. But before I do, I think sometimes it's helpful um, to, to really frame the, the conversation uh, it, it's similar to how Ben did, but you know, why do we care in the first place? I and mean, I really like, uh, I, I like this this phrase that sums up the, the you know the importance of streams and stream crossings. Uh, so ecologically speaking, uh, what are streams? Um, we can think of streams as long linear ecosystems, um, and that's really important because 
you know, the same way that roadways are linear features on the landscape, um, so are streams. Streams are linear features on the landscape. And the same way uh, that we could imagine that um, disruptions to our roadway network could cause real problems, well, disruptions to our, our stream networks cause, cause real problems as well. So unfortunately, all too many of our uh, road stream crossings look like this. Uh, and a crossing that looks like this is an aquatic barrier. And so, uh, you know, using another quote here that I like, uh, it, it really sums up the issue. You know, aquatic barriers are, a, a, we know they're a growing ecological and fiscal liability. They're a real problem. Um, and just to illustrate that, I'm, I'm going to pull this illustration from the U.S. Forest, Service, Forest Service's stream simulation manual. Um, so if we think about, um, you know, streams being, you know, long linear and even long linear interconnected um, ecosystems. Uh, we'll look at this, this figure here and imagine the gray shaded area is the area that a species needs to um, live and reproduce. And so um, in the example in the Forest, Service, Forest Services manual, it's a salamander, but I think it, a lot of people, you know, you can think of this as it's, it's just an example. So, so maybe brook trout is popular. Um, so this is this gray shaded area is where the species uh, is living, and then we put a road roadway through. And if those if the road stream crossings are barriers, uh, then um, then th this is the situation that we see, and we see it quite often when we do our stream sampling, where now these more hollow. Let me see if I can pull up my um, laser pointer here. Um, but if you can see these areas that are now hollowed out, that means that no longer can the species um, fulfill all of its uh, biological requirements in this area, so we, we lose the species from these areas. Now these species are, are lost. Um, and then even where they can persist, where you have enough good quality habitat, um, we can have disconnected populations, so, so reduced populations, which also uh, we know because there's no genetic information being shared that these populations can become less healthy, less resilient. Um, so, you know, just in terms of aquatic connectivity, um, it, these barriers are, are a big problem. Um, but it's just not only aquatic connectivity. Um, undersized stream crossings also tend to cause problems when we get uh, flood flows. So this was a, a photo I took after Hurricane Irene um, in Schenectady County uh, of a stream crossing that failed. Um, you know, probably I assume was doing pretty well during those uh, lower flow, base flow conditions, and maybe even you know some annual high flows and things. But but um, you know when the when storm flows came through, uh, it didn't do so well. So the goal is, then is to take these uh, undersized, poor, poorly designed, poorly installed stream crossings and um, replace them with you know, what we call either right-sized crossings or optimized road stream crossings. So a crossing that's allowing the stream to be a stream uh, and not interrupting that, um, that connectivity. And to do that, we th think of this four-step process. So first we need to uh, figure out where the uh, problem crossings are and then um, have a method to rank and prioritize those crossings so we get to the worst ones first, maybe the ones that are gonna benefit uh, the habitats the most. Um, and then get to the uh, how we actually replace them, target funding towards replacing them, and then ultimately get them fixed. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to um, talk about how we're trying to support that. And I'm going to start with the first two steps, this um, you know, identifying where they are and then ranking and prioritizing. And as Ben talked about, because uh, uh, they use NAC as, as well as, as part of their MOSCAP program, uh, but uh, we do this through NAC. So um, I'm the New York State NAC coordinator, but NAC is not just a New York State product. It's actually a UMERS or UMass Amherst product. <laughs> but it was completed in uh, June of 2015. Um, there were it, lots of partners to, to get this work done uh, from federal agencies like NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, um, state fish and wildlife agencies, DOTs, and conservation groups like Trout Unlimited, Nature Conservancy. Um, so just want to emphasize that it's not just a, a New York um, uh, 
a, a New York database that we use, um, but, but we certainly do support it. Um, so what, uh, how are we using NAC in New York? Well, the elements that we, that we do have, we have this field survey, this standardized methodology protocol for data collection. So now we're comparing apples to apples on, on crossings, you know, even across the state using a standardized survey methodology. Um, the database, once the data are entered into the database, it's all public. So anyone that um, even is watching this uh, webinar today can, can play around with the NAC database um, after the webinar if you're not already familiar with it. Um, uh, we do offer training on the use of the protocols. Uh, if, if you're going to upload data, if you're going to go out and survey crossings and upload data into the database, um, you do need to be certified within NAC and there is some training involved in that and we offer that training. Um, and then once the data are in the database, there's, it's really neat, there's automated scoring systems so you, it automatically generates passability scores. Um, and then you can do really neat things with the data as well, like capacity modeling. There's a, there's a um, Cornell Culverts model that, that can be used. Um, you know, Ben described some of the things, some of the great things they're doing with MozCap. Um, well, uh, module expansion. So most people start using NAC, uh, start using the um, non-title aquatic passability module. Uh, but we are promoting additional modules. It's so successful that we now have these modules. I might talk about that in a minute here. Um, terrestrial and tidal are now available and the condition assessment module is, is um, soon, soon to arrive. So I'll go through a little bit about NAC, but um, if you want to research this on your own, these are the important links. Uh, I would point you to the bottom too, the, the, the web portal. There, there's a southeast version as well, so that just brings you to both. But I would go to streamcontinuity.org slash NAC. That's going to be the landing page that, or the home page. Um, if you just want to interact with the database, that's at NAC.org. So this is the uh, web page, the streamcontinuity.org slash NAC. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not just New York State, so if you are interested in learning more about what, uh, New, York, New York State specifically, just go up here to States and click down uh, and look in New York. Uh, but if you want to enter the database, you're going to go to Data Center. And if you do that, that would bring you here, which is also NAC.org. And I mentioned if you're trained in the protocols, you can um, log in and upload data and, and things like that. Uh, but even without that, um, you can use the database. So you would just go here to search crossings. Uh, when you do that, it's going to bring up this, um, this interface where you can enter as, as much, as little or as much information as you want. Definitely recommend narrowing it down as much as, as, much as you can uh, because it's going it, to, it, it could produce a lot of data and it could be very slow and if you try to like have all 43,000 records um, at once. I think there's even more than that by now. Uh, so you would click here and say New York and then either go into a watershed or, th or this will change as, on the fly as you're using it. So you can select townships within New York and things like that. You then click search and it would bring up a page like this. Um, and here are all the crossings that were surveyed within the search area. Um, and if you know where you want to go with your crossing, you, you know, you interact with the crossing right there. Um, but right here you can uh, access sh uh, shapefile or different Excel reports for uh, the area you just searched, so all of the parameters for whatever the crossings are within that search area. Uh, but what I always recommend, at least initially, is just uh, click on the map results, and then you can see visually um, the crossings in your search area. Um, when you do that, uh, it'll come up like this. You'll have to zoom in to see your dots, <laughs> but you'll zoom in and see something like this, and what we're seeing here is we're seeing black dots and colored dots. Uh, the black dots indicate uh, predicted crossings, but nobody has gone out yet and surveyed those crossings, so we still need data. Uh, the colored crossings mean someone has gone out and surveyed them, the data have been QA, QC'd, and then beyond that, the color coding uh, is going to tell you uh, what NAC calculated as how severe of a barrier to aquatic organism passage that crossing is. So red being severe, and then green being full passage, and then a few colors in between. Um, and if you were to click on one of those dots, it's going to bring you to the actual data page. And again, remember, this is all anything that's approved and in the database, it's all publicly available. So you could, you could go and play around with this today. Um, 
And so every uh, crossing that's been surveyed is going to have at least four photographs, so an inlet, outlet, upstream and downstream photo, so you can get a sense from right from your desk what, how that crossing is interacting with the stream. Um, and then uh, if you were to scroll down, you'd get all of the data, so the, the structure width, you know, dr any drop heights, barriers, things like that. Um, but right at the top here, and, and I'm not sure if anyone can even read this, that's okay, but that's where those calculated uh, AOP scores are, the passability scores. There's a numeric score and a categorical score. Um, and both of those can be helpful in, in figuring out how, how severe of a barrier that crossing is. So I think I mentioned that there are, you know, um, you know different colored dots depending on whether the cross, crossing has been surveyed yet. Uh, this is a, the most recent map we've created showing how many crossings have been surveyed so far in New York. We know there are over 100,000 predicted road stream crossings, and those are just, just places where roads and streams intersect. Not necessarily all of the culverts and bridges in New York, just road stream crossings. <laughs> um, and we have over 30,000 of them already in the database, so we're about a third of the way there. Um, and if you're wondering who's collecting all of this data, um, it's not just DEC. In fact, probably DEC is, is, has collected uh, information at fewer than some other uh, entities like um, we've got the Nature Conservancies doing a lot of these, Trout Unlimited, um, a lot of soil and water, county soil and water conservation districts um, collecting information. And of course, the, the reason um, downstate here is so, so well surveyed is uh, because of the estuary program. Um, so again, with NAC being you know, not just a New York State um, database, uh, it, we need to organize and coordinate within New York State. So one of the ways we do that is through a working group called NAC New York. Um, so currently what we're doing with NAC New York is we, we meet once a month. Um, and it's a, it's a, a working group co-chaired by myself and Josh LaFountain from the Nature Conservancy. But we have a lot of participants, a lot of what we're calling our, our committee. Uh, which is, includes New York State uh, Department of Transportation, um, uh, Office of our Parks Department, um, Ag and Markets, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Army Corps, and, and Federal Highways attend, have, have attended, for sure, uh, Cornell. Uh, definitely those soil and water conservation districts. And more recently, SeaTuck Environmental, I, I had mentioned we, we brought the um, title assessment modules to New York State. And CTUC was a, was a big help with that, a big reason uh, why we did that. Um, so just a little more information on NAC New York, uh, some of the things we're currently working on. Again, bringing those new modules. So we do now have terrestrial and tidal, if people are interested in those. The condition module will be available soon. Um, and some other neat things we've done, we recently rolled out a, a training program called StreamSmart. So if anybody's familiar with the uh, full stream simulation or the stream simulation training by uh, the Forest Service, that, that's a week-long training program. Um, and what StreamSmart is, is it sort of takes that and shrinks it down to one day uh, so that, you know, we still, it's, it's, it gives more information than, a, than some of these shorter, shorter presentations that people often attend. It's a, it's a day's long training, gets really into a lot of design details and things like that. Um, but not quite as intense as the week-long uh, stream sim training. Um, we're also working on, this isn't done yet, but we're working with uh, the UMass folks and, and peop other people in New York to try to um, bring uh, professional development hours, continuing education units, credits to the NAC training. Because um, the NAC training is pretty, you know, we usually, it usually takes about two days. There's, there's field training, there's, um, there's uh, online training modules, and so sort of really incentivizing people uh, to, to take the NAC training. Um, so that's something we're working on as well. Uh, but currently, really importantly, we're trying to have this a better model for statewide coordination. If you remember that map I showed a, a few slides ago, you can see there are definitely areas that are underrepresented. So we want to sort of coordinate better and have like regional people that are, that are sort of helping coordinate NAC, uh, similar to how the estuary program has been doing it for a while. So okay, enough about the finding out where these crossings are and where the bad ones are. Let's talk a little bit about how we're 
trying to target funding towards replacing these bad crossings. Um, and there are lots of ways, but <laughs> the way I'm uh, most involved with is through the WQIP or the Water Quality um, Project Program, Water Quality Improvement Project Program. Um, and what that is, it's a competitive reimbursement grant program um, that funds projects that directly improve water quality or aquatic habitat, in, in the case I'm talking about, or protect a uh, drinking water source. And so if you want to learn more, I recommend going to our uh, WQIP webpage. Um, and a little disclaimer for the rest of my slides um, and what you're going to find on this webpage is it's, an, it's usually an annual program. And so everything I'm going to talk about is based on last year and not necessarily a, a promise for what will happen um, uh, this upcoming round. Uh, but, um, you know, hopefully things m maybe won't change too much. <laughs> They've been pretty similar for the past several years. So within WQIP, again, looking back at 2022, there are um, six project types. I want to focus on two, mostly really just this one, which is the aquatic connectivity restoration category. That's the category that I oversee. Um, but they're also under this non-ag, non-point source category. There's a subtype called culvert repair and replacement that I at least want to mention. So for the aquatic connectivity restoration category, which is the one that is funding uh, the project that Ben just described, um, here's sort of the description. If you go to the web page and, and click on, on that uh, document, you can find everything out of the specifics about each uh, project type and, and requirements and things. But um, this is for projects that improve aquatic habitat connectivity at road stream crossings or dams. So pretty specific to this this. Um, this task. And the key here is that the project must focus on culverts, bridges, or dams that are causing aquatic connectivity obstructions. And the way we do that through our scoring rubric within uh, this project type is by using those NAC, um, those NAC scoring categories. So it's really helpful if you've already done a NAC evaluation on the project there that you're applying fun um, for funding. The other category I just want to mention that has at least existed recent in the recent past is under that um, non-ag, non-point source uh, project type. This is a subtype um, called culvert repair and replacement. Uh, the difference being that the primary purpose of this category is that um, those structures um, had caused erosion, right? So, so um, the purpose would be that the project is to reduce erosion caused by failing or inadequately sized culverts. Um, I do want to mention, though, that in, in that project type, at least in the past, you would score much better if you're also improving aquatic connectivity at that crossing. Um, so I'll, I'll be open for some questions. I just want to show a couple of images. Um, credit uh, Jared Popoli from uh, uh, Portland County for this before picture of a project that um, this, of a WQIP project where the uh, structure was replaced. This is what it looked like before. Uh, this is, I went to the closeout of the project. This is what it looked like afterwards, much better for aquatic connectivity. Um, here are the project through, that was done through WQIP by Trout Unlimited on uh, Green Brook. Um, and the nice thing about this one was they were able to remove the undersized structure altogether and just recreate a stream channel. So, that's it for me. Uh, here's my contact information, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Corbin and Ben. Um, so we will now move into the Q&A portion. So we've got some uh, good questions here. Um, I wanted to start with a question that I think um, is from a different county, um, Greg from Cayuga County. How could a county planning and GIS department specifically start up a culvert assessment program? And is there funding specifically to do culvert assessments? I can take that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, or Corbin, you can you can jump in afterwards. Um, so the program that, that we have been working with um, twice so far is the NUI PIC and the Australia program restoration of watershed connectivity program. 
Um, and that has funded projects for us to do field assessment and design. Um, so I guess that's the one of the options for the last part of the question. The first part of the question, um, I can speak a little bit to uh, as far as um, you know how to get a, a program started um, in terms of the GIS piece is that we, we do model crossings. I talked a little bit about it. Just, you know, the NAC program is such a, a large regional multi-state program that, that you know, the, the elevation data that they use is course and resolution in order to cover just like the large area that they do. And so here in Ulster County, we, we really narrowed that down in, our, in terms of our predicted crossings that we go to. Um, we've got one meter. Uh, LIDAR data. And so we we model streams from that kind of high resolution data. And then we also implement that uh, tenth of a square mile cutoff threshold that I mentioned. Um, and it just helps us really shave down on the field time. You know, like NAC tends to over predict. Um, and we, like our, our results are, I, I think, are a bit more accurate um, which which definitely saves us money and and kind of going around and finding crossings. Um, so yeah, and, you know, going out for for grants, definitely keep an eye on the new pick one. It's it's been really good, um, and like I mentioned, you know, they pay for design work as well. So um, kind of get to that second tier. So Corbin, did you, did you have anything to add? Um. Not too much. I'm and I'm not entirely connected with with planning grants, but I know they do exist. Uh, so I'd definitely look in, into that. Um, we have um, uh, at one point worked with um, Ag and Markets for uh, grants for um, counties, uh, soil and water conservation districts um, were eligible to apply for funding to do NAC surveys uh, in within their county. It was actually broken up by watershed. So those things do exist from time to time. I, I can also say that the NAC trainings that we offer, uh, you know, I'd recommend, you know, you can contact me and we can um, I'll get you NAC trained probably through, uh, you know, some larger training. But those are generally free unless it's unless it's through a workshop or something that you'd have to pay the workshop fees. But what we offer is, is you know, sort of free training. Again, that two-day training to, to get you up and running for, for being able to, um, do assessments in, in your area. That's great. I, do, I have one more thing to add. You know, we're lucky in our area to have the Hudson River Estuary Program, um, which is a program really focused on this work. But, um, you know, we've also had really good relationships with other organizations in our area that, um, you know, the NAC program, a lot of it's volunteer run. And so working with watershed groups to try to get them trained, it's a really good thing for watershed groups to do. Um, it supports the municipalities and in their capital planning and, and counties in their capital planning. So watershed groups, Trout Unlimited, kind of any other water focused um, nonprofit or volunteer group could, could be a really good way to, you know, connect with them and, and get some assessments done. Great, thank you. So you both talked a lot about road stream crossings and we have a question here about railroads. Um, so uh, what about railroad stream crossing and are those included at all in the assessment or implementation projects? Ben, do you want to go for, you want me to go? <laughs> I can talk about NAC a little bit. Yeah, you know, sure. uh, coincidentally, the one that one picture I showed at the end of my um, presentation, the reason that was an old, <laughs> unused uh, rail crossing that was that was removed. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, they, uh, we really focus on road stream crossings within NAC. Um, I'm, I'd have to actually, I should know this. I should look and see if the rail crossings are even in the predicted crossings. I'm not 100% sure uh, if they are or not. Uh, but but I would say not definitely not as much. We don't focus on those as much. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, here in Ulster County, our eastern border is the Hudson River, um, and the Hudson is definitely hemmed in on both sides by by railroad. So, um, in our program, we don't tend to focus on railroads. I know the the county does own 
um, historic rail corridors. I'm not sure if we've ever assessed crossings underneath the railroads, but um, you know, in the conversion of railroad to rail trail, definitely there. I think there are a couple examples of replacing crossings, um, just really upsizing and, and allowing for the natural stream bottom. So I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but I think there are some. Great, thank you. Um, so when these pro projects are implemented, are there any requirements for monitoring before or after project implementation? Corbin, do, is there any requirement for monitoring in WQIP? Uh, no, except <laughs> the project closeout process. Uh, you know, we have to inspect that it's been done, uh, you know, and all, um, according to, um, you know, the application materials and everything. Uh, but, you know, follow-up monitoring, not necessarily. I know some people are doing that themselves, and we have some interesting sort of, um, uh, like, like uh, fish tagging projects and stuff that some that some people are doing, and that's pretty interesting to see what, you know, what's happening in before and after. You know, I always recommend, though, at, uh, using NAC as a before and after as well. You know, we certainly would have the before, and so we have an idea of what NAC thinks that crossing would be. But then afterwards, it's nice to see, you know, you take a crossing from, you know, maybe a, a moderate barrier, and then it's it's an insignificant barrier after the project or something like that. So, but it, yeah, as far as uh, extensive follow-up monitoring, uh, that's that's not a requirement within WQIP for, for, for my category. Yeah, and I know that... Um... The designs for the crossing, um, you know, must not go in as a barrier to aquatic passage. Um, we don't do any really extensive post-project monitoring here either, but we always are looking for kind of good examples of projects. And so we'll we will go reassess a crossing after it's been done just to see how how it's doing. Um, so it's a good good follow up just to just to see. It sounds like the visual assessment is sort of the monitoring that's most common after these projects, making sure everything is stable, erosion, <laughs> passage, right, there, that you don't have that debris there. So that's great. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions about the NAC trainings. Um, so in one of them was in what forms, and I think you may have mentioned this briefly, Corbin, is it offered via Zoom or outdoors field trainings? And then if people are interested in being trained, how do they learn about upcoming training opportunities? Oh, love this question. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing you'd be trained in is, is the non-title module uh, and, and, you know what you do you could contact me and we can set you up with some, it's called owl the online online web learning i think um but it, it will send you to the the modules there are 16 modules that you can do at, on, at your own pace to learn uh, the uh, the next uh, protocol um and that's step one once you've completed those then you would attend a training a field training where you'd be shown um how this all works and we show you all the equipment you'd you'd use which isn't too much but the safe way to assess a crossing and everything like that, that the field training component is step two. Step three to become certified is to shadow um, a, someone who's certified. They're called a lead observer um, or, or a trainer uh, for 20 crossings. So what we do, when I mentioned the two-day training, we would have uh, people have already completed the um, online training modules. And then we go to that training and do everything all at once. So we do the field training and the 20 crossings within those two days. And then when people leave, they're trained. Um, and so sometimes if we get large enough groups, we'll just do that. Uh, but also, like, um, we, we, we go to conservation skills uh, almost every year, and we do a, a two-day NAC training there. Um, so, yeah, it would just be, you know, reaching out, and we try to um, connect whoever is interested with the next training that's being offered. Um, I think that was part one of the question. Was there part two? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how people learn about upcoming opportunities, Zach? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. You know, I guess ask because there is, if you go to the NAC website, there is um, that. Uh, but oftentimes they don't get posted because they're requested and then they fill up. And so there's really not a ton of uh, point in sort of post. We should probably be better about posting any upcoming trainings. 
Uh, but yeah, I guess the best way is just to contact contact us directly, contact me directly, and I will let you know when the next training is. Great. Um, so we've got a question here about a particular bridge washout. So uh, East Holly Lane, town of New Baltimore in Greene County has a bridge that has washed out. How would we begin to replace the crossing? So I think this is similar to what Ben presented in that sort of emergency. This is not planning ahead for future risk. This is a, a um, bridge that has washed out. Do you have any advice on how to handle that? I mean, there are a few bridge funding programs. Uh, most of that work for our county lives with with DPW. Um, so, uh, you know, I know Bridge New York has a round of funding usually every year. Uh, if the project was identified in a multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan, there are FEMA uh, grants available too. Um, but as far as other, other funding strategies, um, if whoever asked that, either wants to follow up with me, I can um, get in touch with our county engineers who, who usually handle the big bridge projects. Great, thank you. I think it's an important reminder too that um, culverts are a risk, even bridges can wash out and, and we need to be mindful of all kinds of uh, road and railroad stream crossings in our, particularly in our changing climate. Um, so we have a question about aquatic life and what happens when um, existing aquatic life is not able to survive because of poor condition or water that's now drying up associated with culverts. And I'm thinking about your, your slide that you showed Corbin with the salamander or the brook trout, you know, how does the, the program consider these areas that maybe could have been supporting habitat but are no longer at this time? Um, well, the, the WQIP program does, so the, I guess what we call our performance measures, the first thing we look at is how severe of a barrier it is, and that doesn't really consider uh, any specific species. Uh, I learned the phrase, uh, you know, all species, all life stages. So it's, how, you know, how, much, how severe of a barrier is the structure um, to aquatic organism passage. The second piece, though, is we look to identify if that, if that is habitat for um, species of concern. And we, we point people to our uh, species of greatest conservation need list. So if any of those species might utilize that habitat, that's gonna help in the scoring. Uh, or if there's anything, um, you know, if it's listed as a trout stream already, or, um, you know, or of course, if there might be endangered or threatened or something like that, um, that, that could be helpful. We actually also have a freshwater mussel layer on our environmental resource mapper. So I would direct people could go look at that and that's gonna tell you if there are maybe imperiled mussels, uh, they would benefit too from, aqu uh, um, from, from aquatic connectivity. Um, so, so yeah, that, so we sort of build it in, but I mean, I guess if the question is more specifically like, if, if we are pretty sure we've lost a species to like that whole system and could the species come back? I mean, within the pro, you know, if, if you want to put that in your application materials, certainly we could look at that and potentially potentially um, put it in that uh, in with the scoring. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here about dams as aquatic organism passage barriers. Is there more information on handling obsolete dams? And I just want to mention that we actually had one of these webinars focused specifically on obsolete dams and dam removal and, and dams as problems both for flooding and fish passage as well. So uh, we'll, we can share a link to that webinar, which goes into detail um, with a local case study and with uh, someone else from DEC talking through some of the processes there. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Yes, absolutely. Dams are a really important barrier to be thinking about as well. And like I said, the subject of, of a whole other webinar that, that we hosted a couple months ago. So there's a question here about, um, where did it go? There it is, okay. Um, as part of a development approval, a culvert bridge is being replaced with a span bridge across the Crumb Elbow Creek. Is that replacement of culvert with a bridge the subject for funding? So not only replacing a culvert with a, a larger culvert, but could you replace a culvert with a bridge? And the second part of this question is around funding that might be available for installation of bridges over wetlands for turtle mitigation. So I think this is more like a um, 
moving people so that there's less of an impact to habitat? I, I can speak again. The thing I'm most expert on is just that one project type within WQIP. And of course, you definitely we would lo love to have people that are, you know, applicants wanting to replace an undersized crossing with with a bridge that spans the channel. Um, the only uh, limiting factor there is that uh, the category, the, the total amount of funding per project um, that can be applied for is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And you know, really, the reason for that is because um, this. Uh, this is a death by a thousand cuts problem, right? This isn't, a, you know, fixing one structure is going to fix the whole problem for the state. So we're trying to get as many, you know, c get funding towards as many projects as possible. Um, so, you know, it, I guess that funding limitation might might not be the easiest way to to build a bridge. Um, and then I, maybe I'd point someone to another category if it's if if the funding's not going to be enough to help get you to the point where you can replace a, a, a culvert with a bridge. But of course, yeah, we'd be very, very much interested in, in structures that are, you know, open bottom bridges, open bottom structures are, are, are usually the best. Great. Yeah, the turtle yeah. question, not, not so much. We, it would be, it would have to be aquatic connectivity. Um, it could, it certainly could be. So if wood turtles are the thing and it's an actual stream channel, yes, of course, I would say apply under um, the aquatic connectivity category, uh, project type. Great. Thanks, Corbin. So I have a question. And, you know, I think as we're thinking about road stream crossings and even with the railroads, you know, there's all of these different jurisdictions that manage our road from federal highways, state highway, county, local roads. So, you know, Ben, in what you've showed, is the county assessing county roads exclusively? Are local roads included in that? And then, you know, for Corbin, are would privately owned culverts be eligible for the WQIP replacement funding, or is that really for municipal culverts? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, so our program looks at municipally owned road stream crossings. So we are doing all of the municipal crossings for all the towns in the county eventually, um, as well as focusing on, on county uh, roads. We're not assessing the state crossings. There are a few state roads in Ulster County, including the throughway, um, but we definitely view that as out of our jurisdiction. So we're we're focusing on county and municipal crossings. So for um, the aquatic connectivity restoration project type, uh, eligible applicants are municipalities, soil and water conservation districts, and nonprofits. And so if it was a private stream crossing, I would just say that would have to be done through one of those eligible applicants. Great, thank you, that's that's helpful. Um, we know that there are culverts and uh, driveway crossings. There are up to the scale of the New York State Thruway crossing over rivers and streams. So I think it's helpful to get sort of a sense of scale and, and ownership and, and who needs to be involved as well in, in some of these projects. Um, so I think I think that's it. We, you know, we have one question here about who can survey culvert crossings to add to the NAC database, but I think you both answered that question. Um, a variety of groups. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. If there's anyone in Ulster yeah. County looking to assess road stream crossings, please get in touch. <laughs> but yeah, anybody, I mean, volunteers up through, you know, state employees, local municipalities. I mean, really, really anybody. And it's it's encouraged, you know, like Corbin mentioned, it's a standardized platform across all the North Atlantic states. So it's it's incredible what we're building, just a, a database with that coverage um, and with that standardization. So, you know, state programs like Corbin's can really look at kind of comprehensive impacts um, and compare crossings, like you said, apples to apples. So highly encouraged. It's a really fun program to be involved with. Um, it's it's just fun. You get to go play in streams. Um, so yeah, if anybody in, in the county wants to help out, please get in touch. 
That's great. Well, thank you both so much for presenting today. Really informative and, and really exciting to hear about all the work that's happening in Ulster County statewide to really make progress on connecting our streams, reducing flood risk, improving habitat. So thank you, Ben. Thank you, Corbin. And we look forward to seeing everyone next month. Um, we'll be focused on the Drinking Water Source Protection Program on May 11th. And then our June breakfast webinar is actually focused on a different category of the water quality improvement program, uh, land acquisition for drinking water source protection. So um, we'll get that information out to you. We'll be sending out the recording um, along with contact information for our presenters because they said that you could get in touch with them to follow up. So we will be sharing that. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.